Welcome to Speaking of Jesus. Each week we hear real people having a real conversation about Jesus, what He means to them. We want to invigorate you to invite Jesus into your everyday conversations too. So, what do you want to say? This is Jessica Bordolo, and I'm here with Dr. Michael Ziegler. Thanks for joining us. Today we're talking about clothes, not something that I'm all that passionate about. And thankfully, my wife and my daughter help me out in that department. We're not discussing the details of current fashion trends, thankfully, just the notion of being dressed appropriately for the occasion. That makes sense because on a day-to-day basis, it's not even something like we think about until it goes wrong. Yeah, then you <laughs> then think about it. Then things can get memorable. Uh, but no matter what your wrong clothes story is, there's a guy in the book of Mark who had it Way worse. worse. But we'll talk about him later. <laughs> for now, the question is, which is worse, to be underdressed or overdressed? Let's hear what our guests have to say. My name is Sarah, and I think it is worse to be underdressed. My name is Chris, and I think it's worse to be underdressed. My name is V, and I think that it's worse to be underdressed. This is Jessica, and I think it is way worse to be overdressed. I'm Mike. I agree with the majority. I think it's worse to be underdressed. So I'm glad at least we have one dissenting voice. Well, Sarah, would you, you give us your explanation? If you're overdressed... It at least shows that you tried, and I think there's a little bit of respect in in your efforts. If you're underdressed, I think it could be perceived as a lack of respect or unpreparedness, and that just looks like maybe you don't care. If I'm underdressed, I have to think that they are looking at me as a little bit less. So you're more concerned about people getting the impression that you don't care Mm -hmm. or that you're being disrespectful. Correct. Yep. Okay. Jessica, since you were the dissenting voice, you give us the other side now. If you are underdressed, it shows that maybe you care less, but that's kind of the point. If I show up somewhere and I'm overdressed, people might think I'm a little overeager, as if I am, you know, thinking something's bigger and better and I really want to show how into it I am. But if you're underdressed, you're kind of cool. You're like, ah, I don't care so much. I, I don't need to impress you with my clothes. I don't know. It seems it seems um, less pretentious to be underdressed. V, let's hear from you. You know, I prefer to be overdressed, even if I cannot change the way I'm dressed. But I prefer to be overdressed and underdressed. I will feel so embarrassed if everybody is wearing, you know, nice clothes and stilettos and I am just wearing my tennis shoes. Like, really, oh my gosh, I'm going home. I cannot be here, <laughs> you know, because you, you are so out of touch with what everybody is doing or wearing that, you know. So uh, that's what I prefer. Okay, now for the fun part. Give us a story about when you were embarrassed about how you were dressed, your, your clothing or, or lack of it. So... When I was fresh out of college, I was on staff at this new church and it was this work day, you know, with like chainsaws and work boots and work gloves and the whole thing. But I was the youth director and I thought I was there to like be with the kids and give them like a devotional, you know, and like do games and crafts with the kids while the work day was going on. So I show up in flip flops, shorts and a hat and a t-shirt, you know, just like I'm ready to you know, just play with kids. And when I get there, there's no kids. I somehow missed the memo that like there would be, I, I, you know, I didn't need to be doing this. And it was all these dudes with their Ford F-150s and their work jeans and chainsaws. Just imagine me like, you know, clearing brush, like standing in whatever and flip flops and getting cut and slowing everything down because I'm trying not to, you know, cut my feet or whatever. And the pastor's <laughs> like, Chris, can we talk about what happened today? Because that did not endear yourself to the men in our church. It was a unforgettable learning lesson. I had also an unforgettable learning lesson. That's why I still remember it today. But it was the opposite. We had a cousin of ours was uh, getting married. And I was maybe, I don't know, 17, 18 years old, insecure in myself. We had arranged with all the other cousins that we were going to wear long dresses, okay, which was the costume they are in, in, in Uruguay at that time. So I get my long dress, which I loved. I still remember it was red with little dots. And so, oh, I love it. I get there with my mom and dad. 
and all my cousins are wearing short dresses. I said, what the heck? I said, what, what are they doing? Oh my gosh, I went ballistic. I, I went to my dad and said, what am I doing? I want to work. go home and change. Home was like half an hour away. And he says, no, you are overdressed. It doesn't matter. You are going to be the best dressed person in the party. So you just chin up and walk in and smile. And that was a lesson that I had to learn. It was hard for me to learn because, you know, I didn't feel that comfortable on myself all the time, all the, the all during the party uh, and the wedding. But it was a lesson to be learned, you know, that you still are who you are and what you are wearing is just an accessory. Well, I also have a wedding example, but mine is the opposite. I was dating Corey at the time, my husband now. So I would keep some clothes at his parents' house. It's hard to keep track of your laundry. And we were headed to a rehearsal dinner. And it was at a pretty nice restaurant in St. Louis. And I thought, perfect, I'm going to wear this dress. So I find it at Corey's parents' house. Kindly, someone in his household had washed it for me. I try the dress on, and it was probably at least three to four inches shorter than it was the last time I wore it. Oh, no. It, it's like time to go. I don't have time to run out to Target and grab another dress off the clearance rack. Nothing. No. I'm stuck with what I have. At this point, I'm already freaking out. I'm like, I don't have a dress to wear. What am I going to do? Corey's like, you have this nice top, and you have a pair of jeans. Put it on. We have to leave now. And these were new friends of ours that were getting married. So that that just makes it worse when it's newer friends that you you really want to make a decent impression on. I show up in jeans and I can just feel it felt like I had 20 pairs of eyeballs just looking at me all night long. It was terrible. It was terrible. I was so embarrassed. I felt terrible all night to people. I was explaining what had happened to my dress because I was so upset. I w- it was a nightmare. I did not like it at all. That's the worst. When you when you feel everybody looking at you. Jessica, your turn. Bear your soul now. I will tell you a sad, sad story of middle school mortification. I was just clueless, period. And I just wore what clothes were fun to wear, what was comfortable, you know, and I wouldn't realize until I got to school and someone made fun of me that I was wearing the wrong thing. I, I didn't know. So class field trip, we're going to downtown Chicago for the day. Everyone's excited. No dress code. You can wear jeans and t-shirts. Oh, how exciting. So I come to school all excited to go for our, our field trip. And I sit down in the back of the classroom. And then like halfway through like our morning devotion, I notice that everybody's back looks the same. Like every single person is wearing a white t-shirt with a big, colorful brand name on the back. And it was the same brand name. Everybody had this kind of t-shirt on. Different colors sometimes, but it was the same brand of shirt. It was the same kind Every single kid, I think even some of the adult chaperones had had this shirt on too. I didn't even know what the shirt was. I didn't have it. I wasn't wearing it. And I just kind of like shrunk down in my desk. And I was like, oh my gosh, no, I was mortified. I was embarrassed. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, you're all, all of your faces make me feel better because you all are just shaking your heads like, <laughs> poor, poor Jessica. Middle school is harsh. Oh, it was harsh. Mine was this formal reception for my PhD graduation at the seminary. And they said formal. And I figured, hey, I worked hard at this. I studied for this for four years. I'm going to go over the top. I'm going to wear a tuxedo. My wife found this tuxedo. It was used, but but we got it tailored. Spent 40 you bucks. You can't come back no. from a tux. Like There's that, nothing. You know, you I was a tie off, over the top. And, I, was, and I, was, I, I knew I might be overdressed. I knew that there that most people probably wouldn't be wearing tuxedos. Well, I get there and, and I, the thing is pressed. It, it looks, it's looking good. I'm, I'm like James Bond tuxedo wearing fiend. And I get there, no one else is wearing a tuxedo, which is okay. Like, I, like you said, I, I knew I'd be overdressed. So I just hold my head up high. I was like, yeah, this is, this is my, the only time I'm going to be able to do this. Five minutes into it, I'm there talking, mingling, and I turn and somebody bumps into me with a full glass of red wine. <laughs> Red wine all down the front, right in the middle. I try, I was in the bathroom for 15 minutes trying to get this stain out. And so I come back in now and I'm in the tuxedo still, but now I've got this pink stain down the front of my shirt. I felt like it was a direct message from the Lord on high. 
for for me as a newly christened doctoral uh, person. Humble thyself. Like, here you go. <laughs> so I, I, I treasure that memory, even though it still hurts to think about it. Okay, so obviously you guys could come up with these pretty easily, and they're very deep. They're emotionally significant events. Why do we care so much about how we're dressed? I know in general this to be true for me, that I care a little too much about what other people think of me anyways. And that's something I'm working on. I'd like to get better at it. But I do know that my outward appearance has a lot to do with how people perceive me. And so seeking that acceptance or validation or status, you name it, you know, I feel like has so much to do with the way I carry myself, what I wear, what I say. But being dressed appropriately, it's just a, it seems like a surefire thing that I should know how to do to be able to get that acceptance. I, I feel the same way um, as Sarah, and, and I have been trying to work on that, you know, and I'm much older than you, and still, I still need work to do on myself, <laughs> not to feel so self-conscious. Uh, but there is also another aspect. I, I think that, and I think it was mentioned before, I want to show respect and honor to the people that I am around. For me, I interpret that if you, for example, if I invite invite you to my house uh, to a dinner and you show up, you know, all ragged and and dirty, and for me that's that says something about how much you care about coming to my house. Okay, so I don't want to do that to others. You know, anthropologists like it, they'll call clothing in a culture as the social skin. You know, it's the thing that connects us to one another. And we're saying, okay, it's almost this like um, written agreement of the exchange that we're about to have. Do you, how much do you notice this? And do you think other people are noticing you? Or is it just that you're thinking about them thinking how they might notice you? Like before middle school, I'd be like, nobody knows. I'm just wearing this comfortable outfit. After that experience... You kind of become hyper aware of what other people are wearing. What you're wearing says something about what your attitude is towards the people that you are going to be with or the events you're at or where you're going. And so it's like what you have to be careful of. Does this outfit say I am cl socially clueless? Does this outfit say I'm trying to look nice because I think these people are important? Does, you know, so. Dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, there is some truth to that, though. I was thinking of that, too, where there's like a list of like four or five things that you can do at your job or something without a lot of effort or something. I forget what the list is called. But one of them is to like dress nicely. And another one is to show up on time. And I forget the other three. <laughs> most, most important, too. If you have someone who dresses nice and shows up on time to a job, you're going to assume that they're a pretty good worker. Or they care. Yeah, right. They care, yeah. Let's move forward here, get away from the clothing discussion, and, and talk about the Gospel of Mark. Uh, because there is an embarrassing detail about clothing mentioned in Mark chapter 14. We're continuing our walk through the Gospel of Mark. So far, we've seen Jesus go from town to town preaching. He's taught in front of large crowds on hillsides small groups around meals and people's homes, even one-on-one -on -one conversations. Oftentimes, we read of Jesus inviting dialogue, engaging people in discussion. And now we're, we're at this critical point in the gospel where Jesus' earthly ministry is nearing an end, and he's preparing to die. Not only that, but he's about to take the sin of the world on his back, right? Take the consequences that should have been ours. He knows he's about to face the utter abandonment of God the Father. Something more bone-chilling, terrible than we can even understand. Jesus is preparing his followers for what's going to happen. He spends his last hours teaching them, serving them. And then, as you listen, the action picks up quickly. It's, there's a time of intense prayer. It's interrupted by men who come with weapons to grab Jesus and lead him away. There's fighting, violence, confusion. And in the panic to get away, one of his followers pulls free from his clothing and runs away naked. So listen to it as we hear Mark chapter 14. Let the words wash over you and put you right there in the action. Now Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to hand Jesus over to them. And they, when they heard it, rejoiced and promised to give him money. So he began to seek how he might hand him over to them at an opportune time. It was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 
when they were slaughtering the Passover lamb for sacrifice. And his disciples say to him, where do you want us to go to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And Jesus goes on to send two of his disciples with a commission and to say to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he goes, enter and say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where's my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready there. Prepare for us. And they went out and into the city and they found it just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover. When it had gotten dark, Jesus comes with the twelve. And while they were reclining at the table and eating, he told them, I'm telling you the truth. One of you will betray me, one who eats with me. And they began to be grieved and to say to him one by one, it's it's not I, is it? It's not I, is it? And Jesus said to them, one of the twelve, one who dips bread with me in the common bowl, because on the one hand, the Son of Man is going away just as it is written concerning him. But on the other hand, woe to the one who betrays the Son of Man. It would be a good thing for him if he had not been born, that man. And while they were eating, when he took bread, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And when he took a cup, giving thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is going to be poured out on behalf of multitudes. I am telling you the truth. I will not drink of this fruit of the vine again until that day when I drink it in a new way in the rule and reign of God. And after they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus goes on to say to them, All of you will stumble and fall. As it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. But after I arise, I will go before you into Galilee. But Peter declared, Even if they all stumble and fall, I most certainly will not. And Jesus said to him, I'm telling you the truth. You, this day, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he kept on declaring, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same thing. And they come to the place called Gethsemane. Jesus says to them, Sit here while I pray. And he takes with him Peter and James and John. And he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he says to them, My soul is grieved to the point of death. Wait for me here and keep watch. And going on a little further, he proceeded to fall on the ground and to pray that if it were possible that this hour might pass by him, he actually said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not my will. But thy will be done. And he comes and he finds them sleeping. And he says to Peter, Simon, Simon, are you actually sleeping? Were you not strong enough 
to watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation because, on the one hand, the Spirit is willing, but on the other hand, the flesh is weak. And he goes again and prays, saying the same words. And again, he comes and he finds them sleeping. Their, their eyes were weighed down, you know, and they didn't know what to say to him. And he comes the third time and he says to them, sleep, finally, and rest, because he is far off. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. Look, the one who is about to betray me has drawn near and is at hand. And straightway, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appears on the scene with a crowd, with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. Now, the one who was going to betray him had given them a signal, saying, Whomever I kiss is the man. Grab him and take him away safely. And he comes and straightway goes to Jesus and says, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And they put their hands on him and grabbed him. And one of those who was standing by upon drawing his sword struck the servant of the high priest, took off his ear. And in response, Jesus says, have you come out against me as a bandit with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And some young man who was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth to cover his nakedness, he grabbed him and he left his linen cloth and ran away naked. And they lead Jesus to the high priest. We don't usually interrupt the Bible reading, but we're going to pause right here because there's an important detail that we need to focus on. There are different interpretations on what we've just heard and what it may mean. The facts are the following. A young man is following Jesus. He's grabbed, and then to get away, he pulls free from his clothes and runs away naked. So some scholars think it might have actually been Mark himself. And there's some things that back that up, like we know from the book of Acts that Mark lived in Jerusalem, and that's where this account is going on. The word used for follower in this passage seems to imply someone not like in the inner circle of disciples, and that was Mark. He was a follower of Jesus, but not one of the twelve. And then Mark is the only gospel writer to include the detail. Maybe he was the only one who knew about it because it was him. (laughs) Whether it was Mark or not, it happened. But what does it mean? Why was he only wearing a linen cloth? The word can be used to describe a light undergarment worn under a thicker outer garment. It would have also been used as a sheet or even a shroud to cover a dead body. Mark tells us that Nicodemus, the guy who takes Jesus down, bought a linen cloth. Same word here. So either way, that's what he was wearing. That's all he's wearing. And in Greco-Roman culture, it could have indicated that he was dressed down for battle, like he was ready to fight. But then, you know, he changes his mind when things get dicey and runs away. This one makes the most sense to me. He was sleeping. And so that's what he was wearing, right? He woke up in such a hurry. He grabbed what was there. He ran to see what was going on. So it's like you grab your bathrobe when you hear a noise and you go see it. So that's what he grabbed on. But who knows? There's a touch of mystery behind the background. But we know that some guy's robe got pulled off in a fight. And it shows what a frenzied moment of panic it was for everyone. Next in the account, Jesus is taken away to stand before the men who organized this ambush. And the chief priests and the elders and the scribes all come together and Peter followed him from a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was there with the attendants warming himself by the fire. Now the high priest and the whole council began to seek witnesses against Jesus in order to put him to death, but they just couldn't find any. For many were bearing false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, 
I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even in this, their testimony did not agree. And so the high priest stood up in their midst and questioned Jesus. You do not give any answer. Why do these men bear witness against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. And the high priest proceeded to question him, and he says to him, You are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you are going to see that the Son of Man is seated at the right hand of power and is going to come with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his tunic and says, What? What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is apparent to you? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some of them began to spit on him and to put a covering around his head and to strike him and to say to him, prophesy, prophesy. And the guards received him with their fists. And Peter. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest comes. And when she saw him, warming himself. She looked at him and says, you also were with that Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it. He said, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't understand what you're talking about. And he went out into the gateway. But again, she saw him And she started saying to those who were standing by, this man is one of them. But he kept on denying it. And after a while, those who were standing by began to say, surely you are one of them because you're a Galilean. And he began to curse and to swear, saying, I don't know this man that you're talking about. And straightway the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered the words that Jesus had said. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And focusing his attention on this, he began to weep. was a word or a phrase that stayed with you hearing it this time? I, I had several because it's a long passage and there are so many scenes in there that capture my heart. But um, the, the first one that really caught my attention was with Judas when Jesus says that one of them is going to uh, or trace on him. Uh, and Judas says, is it not I? Yeah, that's a good point. They all said that. That's so such a good point. They all say that one by one. Yeah. So Judas said that too. Of course, he couldn't do less than the others because otherwise he would be giving himself away. So he was conforming to the group. He tried to stay dressed like the rest of the group. Given our discussion of, you know, clothing, I, it was hard not to see the clothing and listening to you read it. Obviously, the the main one being, I, it's probably Mark. The you know the, the clothing is stripped from him and he runs away naked. And then it was interesting to compare and contrast that with the high priest. I assume it's Caiaphas, tearing his robe and this rending of the garment. And those struck me for different reasons, unusual details to include in this really attention to detail kind of moment in, in history. I can't help but like read beyond this and just notice some parallels with the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. So in the Garden of Eden, we were naked and we felt no shame. And the writer of Genesis is really important, intentional to make sure we understand that. There was no shame. And then after the fall, after Adam and Eve's sin, 
they make coverings for themselves because their eyes were open and they realized they were naked. And so they, and then they, they, they cover themselves in fig leaves and then they go hide. And the Lord eventually gives them animal skin as clothing. But it's this picture of shame and sin for the rest of humanity. You know, this idea of covering ourselves. And what's so fascinating is that here in the Garden of Gethsemane, as our sin is beginning to be atoned for, a man finds himself back in the garden naked. And then you have the high priest tearing his clothing as the atonement is continuing to to occur. You know, here's the Christ handed over and he tears his clothing, <laughs> kind of foreshadowing the ultimate separation of fabric when the curtain is torn and and Jesus dies naked. And it's just, we don't, I mean, these are weird things to talk about. These are uncomfortable things to talk about, you know, being naked. It's, we don't, this is a weird topic of conversation, but he was crucified. I mean, his clothing was taken from him. It wasn't torn. They gambled for his clothing and he hung naked restoring and redeeming the shame that has been upon us since the Garden of Eden. The significance of Scripture's use of unashamed nakedness as a symbol for innocence before sin came into the world, and then as a symbol of guilt after the fall, it's an interesting study when you think about it. Clothing is sometimes used as an image to signify a covering of guilt or sin, and no clothing means no hiding your shame, that the things that you wish were private are right out there in public for everybody to see. In a literal sense, that doesn't mean that we should be ashamed of or hate our bodies. I think this is an important distinction. Yes. Because the human body is beautifully created. It's a gift from God. In God's perfect plan in the Garden of Eden, there was no need to cover it. It wasn't until after the fall that it became something that we needed to keep private. Now, this whole discussion of nakedness equaling shame is not an excuse to to not value and and treasure our bodies. Uh, Our bodies are a gift from God, a gift that will truly be restored when Jesus returns and puts things right again. He's such a valued gift that Jesus himself would take a body and and still has a body now in his, his resurrected, glorified state. Sarah, what was the word that got you? It's kind of a follow-up to what B was talking about when the disciples were saying, it's not I, is it? But it's actually what Jesus says a little bit later that really caught me. He said, all of you will stumble and fall. And I think that's it's kind of interesting that the disciples have that human nature to protect themselves and have that egotistical perspective of like, oh, it's definitely not me who betrays you. I would never do that. But Jesus says, like, eventually we will all fall, we will all stumble. And it, it, it's kind of nice to hear, actually. <laughs> he knows what to expect of us. <laughs> I think we do set ourselves up with those standards of, like, I would never sin. I would never do something wrong to you, Lord. But God knows, Jesus knows that that's not the truth and, and that it's going to happen. So it's nice to hear, weirdly, to, to hear someone say, like, you're going to fail. I like how Peter is st- stripped out of everything you know he thought that he was so strong like we think we are so many times uh, or most of the time and then but when the time came he became nothing and that's where he needed to be for God to work in his life I I relate to that a lot Uh, in, in in a different I think it's in Matthew this is Mark. In the, in the Gospel of Matthew, I think it says, when the, the servant girl came and recognized him, she says the words, your accent gives you away. You know, I, I really identify with that because once I moved to this country, I have an accent and I cannot hide that. And that gives you away, right away. So you don't blend in right away in any place that you are. Okay, all the clothing that you had or that I had while living in my country, that is gone when I am here. When I start talking, if I don't open my mouth, okay, maybe nobody knows. But when I start talking, all that goes away because my accent gives me away and they know that I am a foreigner here. Okay, so then you need to come up with a different set of clothing to cover yourself. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing with Peter there. He had to be stripped of everything. It's like Peter was a little overdressed. It's a little pretentious to be overdressed. 
So Peter's being a little pretentious, like, oh, I'm never going to, I'm never going to deny you. I'm going to, I would even die with you because I'm a little overdressed. Like I'm so fancy. And then you get in the garden and you're like, no, you're not actually overdressed. You're just naked. There's nothing. You're just shame. I guess when it comes to God, we're all overdressed. It's a fatherly sadness too, that why are you hiding? Why are you trying to hide from me? I, I can see you. That's what Adam says. I was, uh, I heard you and I was afraid because I was naked. It's his compassion that seeks us out. And then he's naked for us instead, like on the cross. Ultimate shame. You can't hide it. You're completely exposed. So he, he took that mortification and embarrassment and he did it for us. Give Adam and Eve clothes and I'll be naked instead. The description of Peter is overdressed. That What stood out to me is the word declared. And he says it twice. He declared to him. So he comes with his, his, his bluster, his tuxedo, thinking he can be all that. And it's also interesting. It's not in this account that you read, but it's in John where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And the first thing he, before or after the, uh, is before the, no, it's after the supper. And he takes off his tunic as this like first step of embarrassing himself and shaming himself for our redemption. He removes the tunic and everyone's like, whoa, 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 Lord, uh, Put that back on. Uh, you're you're making a scene, you know. <laughs> yeah, Peter doesn't want anything to do with it. There too, he says, you know, you'll never wash my feet. What about that parable that Jesus told about the wedding feast? But somebody came with the wrong clothes, and they weren't wearing the white robe. And they're like, "Why are you here in the wrong clothes? You can't be here wearing that." Like, if you try to get into heaven with your own clothes, like your own righteousness, it doesn't cut it. You've got to wear the robe of Jesus to cover you, or you, you can't come into the wedding naked. You know, you can't come in thinking that it can be your, your righteousness can be your, of your own making. You're, you can clothe yourself. You have to be clothed with Christ. Right. And Paul has this great line in Galatians that we are, we are clothed in Christ through, through baptism. We have, you have put on Christ. You have taken off the old clothing, the old social skin, and you have a new, new clothing. I, I am, covered and hidden in Jesus. We don't clothe anymore to cover ourselves, but we clothe in Christ to show God's glory, to show God to others. Now, small task. Yeah, to get there, it might take some shame and embarrassment along the way as we are stripped of our facade, of our, you know, peacock feathers that we strut around in. It might take some some loss of that. What are you all getting to know more deeply about Jesus through hearing this account. That he went to that depth to redeem us to the point of utter humiliation and shame to be stripped of all dignity and to hang naked on a cross. It just makes me go, what depths of love, what length of compassion he has that nothing, not even nakedness, would stand in the way. There is zero ego and laying naked in front of an entire crowd of people. We say the word humility not knowing that humiliation is the path to humility. For me, it was very humbling to listen to this passage and talk about this. Very humbling to see Jesus' attitude and compared to what we are, what I am. It's, it was just, um, oh my gosh, I don't know how to say it better. Uh, very humbling and uh, Deeper, much deeper appreciation of what Jesus went through uh, for us. Portion that stands out to me is his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. How does he get through this? Because he he begs his father to to not go through it, to let it pass by, and he even says, you know, all this is all things are possible for you. That he calls him Abba. I, I love that. Jesus knows how to be strong in the proper way. And it's, it's to let his, his father cover him, to, to find his, his strength in being his father's son. Nothing else matters. I think about that portion often when I pray. And so sometimes I'm, I might be afraid to ask him for too much or to ask him to do something that's not what he wants. And I feel guilty for saying, please, just don't let this happen. Please, you know, just don't let me go through this. But Jesus said, you can do anything. Can you take this cup away from me? And so I can pray that too. 
Like, God, you can fix this impossible thing. So if it's your will, can you do that, please? Like, it's okay for me to ask because Jesus asked. But then Jesus says, but your will be done. Like, he still recognizes that if it's not God's will, it's, then it's not the best thing. And I'd- Yeah, this is, this is the most intimate prayer where he's coming before his father naked in some sense of just putting it all out there and trusting that he's still speaking to his Abba. He's still speaking to the one who loves him even though all these, this humiliation, this path is in front of him. Try not to hide from Jesus or from God. Even if we want to hide from him, we cannot. But let him find you where you are and let him do his work. Any clothes will never, ever, ever compare to the clothes that he can put on us and he will put on us. That's his promise. So it's not worth hiding from him. It's not worth it. All our righteousness and righteous works are like filthy rags, but he he provides the the clothing. Yeah, so don't let that stop you from coming to him. You know, I would I would want people to know that if they feel like they're not good enough and they're embarrassed because of things they've done or didn't do and they just feel like, you know, naked and ashamed and how could I go to God dressed like this? But that he's got something to cover you. You know, he's waiting with a robe for you. And he was naked in front of everyone and the Father on our behalf. He did that for us so that we don't have to do that. So don't let that stop you from coming to God in prayer or from wanting to be a part of his of His church because he will cover you. God will cover you. This reminds me of the parable of the prodigal son. The son, he rejects his father, leaves home, walked away from his family, doesn't look back, things don't go as planned, and when he's broke and hungry and alone, all he wants to do is come home. Yeah, he was too ashamed to even face his dad after what he had done. So he planned an apology speech, saying he knew he didn't deserve to come home, but could he just come back as a servant? So he shows up in tattered clothing, he's covered with the mud of pigs, but to his surprise, his father runs to meet him, grabs him in a big hug, and before the son can even finish his apology speech, his dad gives him a change of clothes. He summons the servants. They bring the best robe and put it on him, put a a family ring on his finger and new sandals on his feet. So now he's dressed not like a servant, not like a hired worker, but as a son. That's you. That's me. When we come before God with nothing to offer, we can't even clothe ourselves, let alone bring him anything. We're too busy trying to hold up our fig leaves to carry any presents. But just like the father of the prodigal son, God runs to meet us and covers our dirty, stinking self with a clean robe. Isaiah 61 says, He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And we also read in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, In Christ Jesus, you all are children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. That means your sins are forgiven. It means you're a loved child of God. You're welcomed into his presence. No more crouching in shame. You can live in joy and peace knowing that through faith in Jesus, you have nothing to hide from God, nothing that you need to hide. Thanks for being a part of the conversation. You can listen to past episodes on our website, jesuspodcast.org, or wherever podcasts are found. But please leave us a rating and a review, even a short one. It really helps. Check out our Facebook group. It's called Speaking of Jesus. See pictures of our guests each week and interact with what you've heard. Next week, we'll talk about what it feels like when a friend has your back. You're not alone. They've got you covered. We pray that this week's podcast has encouraged you in your faith and has invigorated you to speak of his love into the lives of those around you. See you next week. As always, we'll hear from Dr. Ziegler in a real conversation between real people speaking of Jesus. What do you want to say? You know, like Greco-Roman wrestling, you got to strip down for battle. I know you like <laughs> I always wrestling. find a way to bring it back to wrestling. Wrestling.